Hello and welcome once again to episode 99 of Code Completion. We are a group of iOS developers and educators hoping to share what we love most about development, Apple technology, and completing your code. My name is Dimitri and I'll be your host once again for this episode and I'm joined today by my fellow completionists, Spencer. Hey there. And Fernando. Hello, hello. So our conversation got quite heated last week, but we never actually got to the second point you wanted to make, Fernando. So please enlighten us. I don't know if I want to. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's too late for oh, that. No. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely too late for that. So um, I found something that is really cool, and I'm sure a lot of people have already uh, seen it, which is the uh, Doxy framework a compiler. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to call it specifically, but Doxy is basically a... Doxy is the compiler. It's a compiler, Literally, right? The yeah, C, yeah. the C in Doxy. Yeah, doc, compiler. document compiler. Yeah. So, Doxy is basically Apple's foray into taking documentation very seriously, right? Uh, Apple's always been rel relatively good about documentation. I remember in the early days, um, we didn't have like Stack Overflow. We didn't have a lot of like the amazing resources that that we have today. So what you do, would, you would just go to developer, uh, to window, developer documentation, and then just like try and figure out what to do. Um, and Apple has great, had great documentation uh, with detailed explanations. They had example projects and everything. It fell off a little bit during the past, I don't know, from like 2014. Two decades. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, it's been it's been sort of in a decline. But from like 2014 to 2018, I literally just stopped using documentation. Cause it, it got really slow. It got really bad. It got very incomplete. Um, so, so would you say that Stack Overflow eroded Apple's documentation efforts? Because I, I would say like there's... right around the time where Stack Overflow got really useful, Apple documentation stopped like getting added to. Like the old documentation stayed and then like plus 10 years to that apple just like archived all its old documentation which made it yep. obsolete um and then it got like instantly worse as a result of that um so yeah i don't know if there's like, a causality to it like mm -hmm. but Su super yes the timing fits yeah super side tangent uh i remember around xcode three or four my documentation viewer just got busted like some caching thing for WebKit just broke and therefore the documentation viewer window in Xcode just stopped working for me. Um, and ever since then, I like broke that muscle memory of going there. So I never use that window anymore ever since that point in time. So Literally the same happened to me. Literally the mm -hmm. same thing. Probably Xcode 4 because I like I remember Xcode 3 being really stable. Uh, well, really in, as, as much as Xcode can be. Um, and then at some point in time, it just stopped working, like the documentation. And so, just like you, I lost the muscle memory for it. It sucks. I really liked it. It was. It used to be like pretty instantaneous, uh, looking for anything in the documentation, and then it started getting very laggy, very slow. Sometimes it wouldn't load, and then you just like, I'm not gonna waste my time here. So De derailing mm. us one more time. Uh, has anyone here used the class browser in any Xcode project? So you have all those tabs, right? And one of them is a type or class browser, which should give you a hierarchy of all the classes, all the protocols, and give you like quick access to all the methods. That has not worked since Swift. <laughs> and it's just been like, this would be such a useful tool to like find out what methods are available on array, a uh, mm -hmm. Swift language that has separated everything into a million protocols. Um, but that that also just does not work, so. Uh, another point to to anything over nothing <laughs> at this point. I think what's frustrating is Apple is trying to do, like, to put everything into Xcode. Like, uh, for real, for those that that remember, like, Interface Builder used to be its own app, and when they merged it into Xcode, I was like, eh, I guess it's okay. I guess it it kind of makes sense. But then, like, now we have a Git client, a uh, ton of different stupid things that we don't need that I don't remember because I don't use them. Uh, but I just keep reading the, the notes and they're like, 
more things, put more things into Xcode. I'm like, why? It's, you they can deleted Xcode Cloud, so that's good. Or Xcode Server, not Cloud. Xcode that's Server. Yeah. Yes. But yeah, that one that one's being deleted as of Xcode 14. So one big chunk of code is disappearing from your life, <laughs> Fernando. Yeah, it sucks. Well, I love when code disappears, but this one stinks a little bit. Uh, anyway, so back to Doxy. Doxy is basically um, Apple's worry. Like, it seems that someone at Apple is trying to bring back um, the old glory days of like having really good documentation. And they started building a compiler for it, which will take your documentation and will use like, I, I'm betting a form of modified markdown to make your documents great. So should, should I say it? Make documentation great again? <laughs> anyway. You did. Uh, it's really like that's one of the things that's really good in general. But in the end, documentation it's like it's like a book, right? There there's people that don't like reading. They may like coding, but they don't like reading. They're very mm. hands on. Nothing wrong with it. Well, there's something wrong with it, but I won't say. <laughs> but <laughs> but like Ooh. the the really cool thing about Doxy isn't that you can build documentation, which is good. Um, the really cool thing is that you can build tutorials. Um, mm -hmm. So, like, if you've ever gone to Apple's webpage and followed one of their like really amazing Swift UI tutorials, um, you've you've seen the output of Doxy. Doxy will take that those tutorial steps with screenshots and code. And it will clean them up and present them into um, a fantastic web page. And so. Do you guys see where this is going? I think so. Okay, I'll take guesses. Spencer. <laughs> You're saying we should all use Doxy for our own apps at work and, and I don't know, write tutorials <laughs> for... You're, you're pretty close. Yes, I in, want to use in, Doxy. Do instead of PRs, we write tutorials in Doxy and just merge them <laughs> into main. <laughs> oh my gosh. That would be great. But no, not instead of PRs. So... Um, there's two things that I've discovered. I literally discovered them last week, so I haven't put them a lot into, into effect. One of them is that following the code in a code review is complicated, right? Mm -hmm. You just go in, and again, it's like a book, but it's a choose-your-own-adventure book. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard when it's like it only gives you a few lines before and after whatever code has changed. So right. that can yeah. be definitely hard. How to many follow. times have you clicked the up arrow, up arrow, up arrow, up arrow, up oh, arrow, yeah. expand, expand, expand? Oh, that's the function we're in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah, right. That was so, so much worse than Objective C, by the way, because like none of the Git clients understood the Objective C syntax for like marking <laughs> the line with, oh, hey, this is in this method over here, just like plus 20 lines or whatnot. whatnot. It would just say like, oh, you are an import uh, at import foundation. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, that's not useful. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, so it, it, it is, uh, going back to our previous um, episode, it, it is simpler, at least, without getting into another tangled mess. It is way simpler if you have someone explaining the code to you, right? Like, yeah. of course you can do it, and the, the better developer you are, the easier you can follow the code outside of an IDE which GitHub or Bitbucket is outside of an IDE. But what the, 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 the thought that came to mind was this is basically a tutorial. I'm trying to show you uh, something, how I did something, which most tutorials are like, oh, you click here, type this, run, look how pretty the screen is. So I thought, well, what if I did a tutorial about my PR? I go in, I describe the changes. Doxy is really powerful, so it lets you like have pieces of code, and it will automatically uh, detect the differences, the git differences between them, and it will highlight them step by step. Yeah, so I think that's really instead cool. Instead of if you like going through your, through your GitHub pull request, through your own pull request, um, and saying this, like creating a new object starts here, follow the path, and then here, watch out for this, blah, blah, blah. You just do it in a streamlined way. And the beautiful part of it is that the code that you can show in the tutorial doesn't have to actually compile. 
And what I mean by that is that you can take parts out of each method and just add like ellipses instead so that you can focus the reader's attention on a certain part of code. And you can start doing that as if it were like a summarized version of your PR. This, of course, doesn't, doesn't supplant PRs as much as Dimitri would like. I'm kidding. <laughs> but it is, a, it is a really good intro slash summary into the PR. So once you know that, you can just go in and not be confused by a lot of the... Uh, of the code and you could follow it way more easily. This is in my mind, this is the async way of explaining what the PR does. Is there a lot less setup doing something like this compared to say, just recording yourself going through and talking about the PR? What do you mean by a lot less setup? Like to get the tutorial up for the doxy, uh, like all the individual like uh, files, uh, make sure that the steps are going through correctly. Um, like, is it easier to do that or is it easier to just record yourself like with a screen recording and talk through your PR in There's a similar way that you would yeah. kind of describe it via the tutorial? Yeah, there's two different points here. The first one is that it's way easier to do the tutorial, um, to add the documentation and the steps to the project. The By the way, if you have never used Doxy, Doxy actually lives inside the Xcode project, lives inside your repo. So when you create it, it's right there along with like the frameworks, your code, uh, everything. Um, so it's actually way easier to do that. You just right click new documentation and then right click new uh, content uh, list and then right click new tutorial file and you just start writing. However, it is if you if you can record yourself and not edit, it is way faster to do that, right? Because like as Spencer and, and you like Dimitri already know, um, editing video is like, it's like three times the, the time yes. it takes to just like record it. Yeah. So if you could just record yourself going through like, hey, this, that, blah, 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 uh, it's way faster. Um, I mean, you're not you're not publishing this out to the world. You're just correct. kind of making the point for your PR. So the editing is like very not necessary. Um, correct. Yeah. The, the 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 though the question there is like how easy it is to absorb in video form versus in tutorial form. Yeah. Which I don't know, right? It depends mm -hmm. on the person writing, on the person reading, on the person watching, etc. But yeah, that's I, I've actually done that too before. We um, we have uh, our 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 English is hard. Our iOS team um, is spread out, so we have uh, people here in the U.S., me, and people in European time zones. So sometimes there's very little overlap. So what I've done is in the past, I've done one or two code review videos. The disadvantage of it is that if you just click record and try to explain the code, I for one ramble a lot and fumble a lot. Like you say, oh, I tried this code because I tried this other thing and then this other thing didn't work because of X, Y, Z and then, and then, and then you, you spend like three or four minutes trying to justify your code in the same spot and then you move to another spot and do the same. So you either need some preparation with a script, even if it's just like a very quick 10 line script or you need to edit the video or something like that because otherwise, personally, I tend to find that I rumble a lot. I think it's interesting though, like <clears throat> from the perspective of like what we currently do, at least at my job for pull requests is at best, it's like they've written a summary in, at least in Bitbucket, it's been a hot minute since I've used a pull request in, in GitHub, but like after you make the pull request or rather as you're making it, you can kind of make like a, you like obviously you have the, the title of the pull request, but then you have like I, I don't know what you call it, like a description or a sort of a summary of the pull request. And that's where this kind of uh, comments on what the pull request does overall, you know, what code was changed does. So putting it in, in something like more structured, uh, like 
in a doxy tutorial i think obviously would take more time but also i think there's definitely a benefit there so it'd be interesting to try it out um i've never i i mean i've i've you know seen a couple things on wwdc about uh doxy and, and everything but i've not used it um so it'd be interesting to try out i can definitely see especially for like a longer pull request that's fairly involved right i don't know if i'd make a tutorial for every single pull request especially like quick one-liners but like something that's like hey here's this huge feature that was added um or whatever i can see it here are a bunch of methods on this model that i added that do very specific things here's how to use them kind of thing yeah the the biggest benefit i found is following the code across classes so for example i'm trying to build a um build the documentation here and obviously xcode is refusing um but like usually you have to like pass along some info to your delegate and then do pass that to your view model, wait for a network request, after the network request, parse the results, cache it, save it, whatever. All of those usually are all over the place because of like modularization if your code base is decent. And so it's easy to follow inside Xcode. It's really hard to follow on GitHub or Bitbucket, right? Does does GitHub give any nice preview for the Doxy stuff or do you need to still check out everything manually and then build it and then see it in Xcode. I don't think I don't think GitHub does any of that. So you would have to check out the branch and just build the documentation. Which right now is telling me that derived derived data is doing something funky. Yay. The life of an iOS developer. On the topic yeah, of like Doxy the, though. Oh sorry, go for it. Yeah, yeah, the, 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 there's a, a big advantage and a big disadvantage in spending more time in your code, uh, code reviews, right? The big advantage is that while doing the tutorial, uh, for example, the, the tutorial that I'm trying to show you, I, I found several of my own mistakes, which I most likely would have found during my own code review, but this feels more structured. During my own code review, I just go through each file, and since I know what each file does, I can try and link it to um, where it's going, to the, where the process is going, but it's not automatic. I have to like remind remind myself of it. And with the tutorial, you can read the steps and you can see the code in one go. So it's very immediately obvious when you're doing something wrong, when you're passing a, an extra parameter, when you're not setting a parameter, things like that. Very, very obvious. Um, I have a very important the, question for you. Yeah, yeah, Do go you, for it. Did you write tests along with this? Because tests would always also immediately like point out where you're like missing arguments or stuff because you have to use the code that you wrote. Um, and given like, of course, it's not automatic, but if you do write a test in a very like structured way that can describe how to use the code that serves the dual purpose that the tutorial is also doing, except it's also compiling it and making sure it's valid, right? Right. I did a few tests, um, but they're more, the tests helped me find issues with the actual implementation, not with the communication between layers, right? Because what I'm trying to do is like black box test a class. So mm -hmm. yeah, not it would have helped me find the same issues. Altogether. What was that? not testing a whole bunch of different classes together. Exactly. Basically. Yeah. And and with the tutorial it isn't it's that you're sort of like testing them. As as I said the doxy code does not compile. It yeah. highlights correctly but it doesn't compile into anything. So you may obviously miss stuff, but it is very apparent when you're trying to explain what the code is doing. Right? Okay, I think I'm never going to show this. <laughs> I remember a tangent while, while we sort of wait. A friend of mine that used to work with me at uh, J2 Global um, built a small script or a small daemon app. No, what do you call the, the apps that are on the menu? Like menu apps? Menulets. Menu bar apps. What was that? Menulets. Menulets? I like that name. Yeah, he built a menulet called XSOAP. Which would basically, it was, I, I believe it was just one button that was like de delete derived data. 
So whenever he had issues, he would just go to his menu, boom, delete the right data. I get it. So I, this is this is my chance to give a PSA. Uh, do not do not delete your drive data. Uh, there are some things in drive data that you can delete, but do not just delete drive data. Drive data has a lot of useful things like logs of past builds, uh, archives, all sorts of fun stuff. So uh, go in there and delete the build artifacts. Definitely, like that's okay, but do not outright delete drive data. That's a Who needs that's usually a poor logs? decision. If you if you want to have some sort of historical evidence of how past tests went, uh, things like that, that's generally useful uh, over time and more useful once you learn what it's actually keeping record of. Um, and most of that information does not take up a lot of space. Uh, but the build artifacts, certainly they do. Um, and and yeah, you can go ahead and delete those. Um, and index is another common thing that people like to delete. Uh, but do not just delete drive data and public service announcement. But the more you do it, the less historical information you lose. Yeah, because you just don't care at that point. <laughs> <laughs> you are too clever, Dimitri. Um, so while we're on on the topic uh -huh. of of Doxy, this is kind of a tangent as well. But um, I saw that um, I. I don't know, it, the repo is two months old, but um, as of a few days ago, the entire Swift programming language guide is in on Apple's GitHub uh, that can be built in Doxy. So that was, Interesting. That was cool. Yeah, nice. super, they just open source the whole thing. And that uh, guide is awesome. It's got a bunch of stuff and I'll often recommend it to students and stuff, but like there's a bunch of stuff that is super useful to me so yeah kind of cool i always refer back to it yeah the drawback is this is a lot of work right you have to go yeah. into a piece of code copy and paste it and then do a bunch of stuff to it um oh and yeah the worst part uh, um, a mental issue that i've that i just ran into is that uh, setting up this tutorial um to give you a little bit more context we were, we had an issue with how images were being downloaded we were using a very old library and the very old library wouldn't would just decode happily decode any image so having is it called sd image no no okay what is it i had to take that one out to the back and <laughs> say goodbye <laughs> goodbye that happened no it was an even older library called pin remote image it's written in objective c and it stopped being maintained i think in 2018 so i'm not surprised that it had that issue but coupled that with a few duplicate requests from the ui because of course um we had a, a memory spike whenever you downloaded a bunch of images or attachments that would just kill the app so i had to rip that apart and use a new framework what framework do you recommend dimitri i i chose kingfish writing it yourself I, I was this close to writing in myself, and I, I built it in such a way that, that... I mean, it's an excellent opportunity to write documentation <laughs> with Doxy hey. on how to use oh it. My God. I, maybe. Like, this isn't, it isn't a bad idea, and I was this close. The more I, I worked on integrating Kingfisher, the more I was like, I just need to do this myself. But I just fell, fell prey to the sunken cost fallacy. I was like, I'm already this far... I would have to go to my boss and say, hey, you know what? I'm just going to build it myself when it is a critical issue that needed to be fixed right away. So, um, But yeah, the point of it is that um, explaining how we download like avatars, explaining how we down, download and refresh and reset the cache from permalinks um, that may mm -hmm. change, uh, all of that took me probably like three hours three or four hours, which I don't, I think that's a decent amount of time because here's a little bit more story. Yeah, I have to, to do that tangent a little bit. The first time I implemented this doxy thing, I went into a pull request and I just detailed the changes of the PR. So I was like, this is how it looked before. This is how it looks now. This is the code that used to be. This is the code that is now. And that was really, really helpful in the sense that you could see how before you would jump 10 times to different objects that were all like 
tightly coupled and in the new flow it'd be just like two or three objects that have single responsibilities um mm -hmm. but i realized that all the work that i had put in was going to be wasted right it would just live as the pr changes processed by me which kind of sucked so for the next iteration what i did was okay instead of doing that i'm gonna actually build the documentation that explains the process of what i'm doing and that is a more permanent thing right the mm -hmm. if anyone asks hey uh i need to change this on how we download avatars all right just go and read the documentation and it's a tutorial so even though it took me like three to four hours going through it actually takes you like 10 maybe 15 minutes so yeah. that's the, the moral issue that I have with this, which is like it's, I'm tr putting in a lot of effort and consuming it is very quickly. I want people to suffer as much. As, no, I'm kidding. But, <laughs> but I it's mean, that's difficult. the whole point of documentation uh -huh. and tests, right? Is to put a right. lot of upfront effort to save yourself in the long, long run. Um, so yep. here, if you're building something that's going to help future developers of the project and even yourself, like, frankly... Uh, we are always a future developer to the same project that yep. we're working on. Um, yep. If it's going to save us a few months down the line, then it's always worth it, right? It's not like you are... Uh, it's not like it's going to take an exponential more amount of time uh, to build the documentation or the test for something. Um, it's always a linear amount of time with regard to how much like code you wrote initially, right? Um, it's never like increasing in complexity. So I think it's, it's something that's always worth, like, I would say more for managers to understand is necessary rather than like, we don't have the time for a test, just go forward. Um, like that is never worth it because once you go forward, you forget how the code is supposed to run and you forget any nuance that you had in the back of your mind. And therefore the tests that you write later are kind of useless. The, the catch up tests, right? Um, or the catch-up documentation. Um, however, at the same time, once you do have tests and once you do have documentation, that's something extra to maintain as you evolve the project and evolve how things work or fix bugs. Um, and that's something that might not happen in tandem, right? Tests are a little easier because they stop compiling or stop working as you, as you make the change a little too big. Uh, but you have to manually remind someone to also update the documentation in such a case Otherwise, that kind of falls out of sync. So that can be helped by tooling. Like tooling can look at the doxy and notice, hey, this message signature no longer matches reality. Make sure you update it. Um, and like part of that can be handled directly in the documentation comment above the method. Like there are warnings for that in the compiler. Um, but I don't know where we are at with regard to like a tutorial because nothing is worse than a tutorial that's no longer valid right because then you think that everything is like swimming and then and then you realize the reality is very different and nothing that you're think you understand is actually working but that's that's a good point and, and something that i've been thinking through i i don't know i don't know the reality of this because it's too early in the process but unless it's like completely completely wrong the tutorial will give me a historic sense of how it was done at one point in time. And I think there is value in that. Um, I think uh, we'll, we'll see in the future, but even, even if this falls out of, out of, uh, uh, out of date, I don't know how to say that. Even if this falls mm -hmm. behind like the actual code, um, it'll provide a sense of how I wanted to do, to download images and do things and cache them and whatever uh, mm -hmm. for, for people. And so they can go in, they can catch up to this point in time in the app's lifetime and then jump from there. Which, yeah. for example, I joined, um, I joined Basecamp when the whole iOS team basically left. So I joined a project with no documentation, with basically just a bunch of code that's hanging in there that wasn't even compiling for the M1. So it's like even old old tutorials would have helped me understand like business mm -hmm. logic about Something stuff better instead than of me. Yeah, exactly. So I agree. It's, it sucks that this isn't the problem we have solved, the documentation not being stale, but something does feel better than nothing. 
I think what I like about this is like, <clears throat> if we had a Venn diagram of like the amount of work you put into a pull request and like yes the rest of the app or documentation, you're like definitely bringing them together. And that's like a really cool idea. And it got me thinking where right now, a lot of our documentation is um, at work is in Notion for like larger things like going through our rendering pipeline. Like that's a whole thing. And my, my boss has written a whole, you know, awesome a couple pages on document of documentation on there and i'm like holy crap but it would be cool to have that in doxy and like if uh it ever was changed or or whatever um having it in a tutorial style like i guess the thing when i read that documentation is like it's so dense and it's like yes a lot of it is conceptual right and that's just the way that documentation is a lot of times maybe he'll reference a few methods but it's like the i i don't know with a tutorial it could be a little bit more digestible and like you could feasibly write again like pseudocode because the the code doesn't compile in the doc c but you could have a little bit more um depth i suppose with like actual there, code yes mm -hmm. absolutely one thing i found out was that um showing the code is difficult because code is nonlinear. Like you yeah. can't just read from top to bottom and expect to understand it, right? You have to, even within one function, if that function is asynchronous, you have to jump around and picture things differently in your mind. Well, not if you use concurrency. <laughs> hey, asynchronous. No, you still have to picture them. You have. You still have to picture them. Happening. It's all linear. It's just asynchronous. Well, that's Anyways, my point. For another point uh, in time, <laughs> I really, I really want to move into Async Land. Uh, that's a really good. It, point. it makes I, things I so much nicer. Happened. That's that's my my tip to you. Uh, is there's a, much less of that jumping around, and anytime there is jumping around, that's like an immediate code smell that you're probably doing things right. wrong. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, but what I was going to say is that, like for instance, I have this. Uh, uh, it's old school, but it's an operation. Um, and the operation basically has a completion block that needs to be set before we add the operation, right? So you have part one, initialize the operation, part two, add the completion block to the operation, part three, queue the operation. Well, if you're writing the tutorial, you don't need to show the completion block right away. It doesn't, it yeah, doesn't matter. You can gloss right? over it. Exactly. You you just literally don't put it in the in the tutorial. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I found that it's really cool is that you can build up to the final version in steps. So a person goes and sees the golden path for a function and they're like, huh, I get it. And then on the next step, next chapter, next whatever, so don't forget you add this curveball. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, remember that you need to do this. Or remember that before we even get to this, we need to process the image, which is a whole different process. So you don't even introduce that whole different process. You just basically say, ah, this is what happens. And then now that they understand it, you go on and, and tangent off of that into another chapter. Uh, it's really, really powerful. I'm 100% going to be doing it for like bigger PRs. Um, and the big benefit is that I don't want, if all the iOS team leaves tomorrow, which I hope it doesn't, uh, or if we get fired, I don't want our um, successors to be in the same spot where they're like, all right, I guess I just dive into this whole thing and have fun because mm -hmm. I didn't have a lot of fun. I mean, I had some have fun. fun. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I'd and say again. Go for it. I was just going to say, and again, the successor could be you in a couple months, and that's... Yeah. It always <laughs> is. <laughs> yeah. That's a, that's, a, that's a one, like, truth that you learn as you gain more and more experience as a developer, uh, is you will always be shooting you from two months from now in the foot every time you take any shortcut. Uh, yeah. And, like, you really do need to document... Like, I've saved... Like, uh, you get to the point in your career where you start doing this regularly, and then you realize, oh, shoot, I saved myself by writing all these comments because this none of this makes sense without all this explanation yeah. that, like, leads me through what the general plan is and then, like, how to work on it. The only thing is that to maintain all of that, 
like that's where code review comes in, right? Someone goes and makes one change to the method and you have to make sure that you are there to say, hey, don't forget to update the documentation here that's also related to this. Otherwise, it's like not going to make sense over time. So that's why there is a human factor towards code review. It's not just like, hey, run all the tests, make sure they pass and then yep. move yep. on. Uh, the linter is happy. Therefore, there's no code formatting issue. Um, like all of those are tools, but there is still a human factor to all of this because at the end of the day, it's humans that are working on it. Right. Um, and it's humans that have to understand it for yeah. now, for now. Well, yeah. not even for now, a GitHub copilot is just going to put us out of a job. Yeah. I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> there will always be artisanal programming, Fernando. Um, that, that is something that's, programming. I mean, we still have vinyl. Uh, this is going to be something that's going to, that's going to last forever. And, uh, like we might not be paid very much for it anymore, but, uh, or it will always maybe exist. We, we get paid a lot like COBOL programmers. Yeah. And it'll be sold on Etsy. So that's it. I am, um, I'll show it to you guys afterwards. It's really cool. That's yeah, no, this is a, a really cool idea. I, I need to, I, I wish I could contribute a little bit more. I just haven't, um, used doc C personally. Um, but I love Apple's tutorials and I can definitely see the value in doing it yourself for something large. I, I think you could definitely kind of go a little bit, um, crazy with it and try to do this for like every pull request not you just in general people could kind of go to the extreme and take way more time than it's worth for things that are like a one-liner change and be like hey let me write this five-step tutorial on changing a single line of code it's like <laughs> uh, okay maybe not i mean but, sometimes sometimes i mean that's where like test driven it. development falls apart right it's it you exactly. you should use it as a yeah. tool not as a mantra right this week's episode of Code Completion is once again brought to you by Super Easy Timer. Super Easy Timer is a quick and easy to use timer app for your Mac. It's completely text-based, so you can type in English what you want, 20 minutes or 5 p.m. Hit enter and instantly start a timer. The timer understands English text to create, update, and start a new timer. You can quickly change an active countdown, even while it's still counting down. There are simple keyboard shortcuts or set or pause, no menus, no sliders. Just use English to control your timer. We want to thank Super Easy Timer for sponsoring our show. Search for Super Easy Timer on the Mac App Store today to give it a try. So we have a second uh, mini topic for today, uh, and that is all about uh, Apple's far out predictions. Uh, so they have, uh, let, me, let me start that over. So we have a second mini topic uh, for today, and that is all about Apple's far out event, uh, which should be happening the day after this releases. Uh, so what better time to uh, have some predictions about what is going to come out? I don't know. I haven't been following the rumors at all. <laughs> just, I just know <laughs> it's new phone time and that's all I've, that's all I've got. <laughs> I'll, I'll start with it. It's a, always a new phone one. time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll start with a good one. Is there an iPhone 14 mini? Ooh. I don't think so. That's that's like the really? saddest part of all this, right? Is yeah. like all the rumors have basically pointed to this device not existing anymore. And it really is my favorite form factor for a phone. I think Apple just needs to make an iPhone Pro mini. And that would be mm. like they, they insist to themselves that the mini device has to cost less. Um, and that doesn't have to be the case. But if it had all the same features, especially camera wise, uh, than the larger one, then I think people would forgive it being a little thicker. Uh, like as long as the the form factor of the screen itself is smaller. Um, and mm -hmm. if it's the same price as the pro, just, hey, you're paying for minification, right? That's what we used to do. Um, like nowadays, like that's an unheard of concept, but. Uh, I think a lot of people would be happier choosing the smaller form factor than the larger one, given the same price. Yeah, I, I think I would try the mini. I mean, I've definitely got the pro because it's the pro. But I mean, even the pro size, like hitting the back button is a pain. And I have to like do finger gymnastics to make it work. So if there was a pro mini, I'd I'd take it. 
I think I, I've fallen out of love from uh like for the mini. Hmm? I I really like the form factor, but the battery, I just hmm. can't. That's what I'm saying. They could make it thicker. It doesn't need a compromise oh. and being the lightest phone possible, right? That's not why we care about the mini. We care about the mini because it's the smallest like screen ratio. Like it fits nicely in your hand. It can be two millimeters thicker, and I don't think anyone would care. No. Right? I agree. No. I think that's the one shortcoming because I'm like between the the a rock and a hard place because I don't want the mini anymore because the battery is not good enough for my use. And I don't want the regular sized iPhone because it's huge. Mm -hmm. Like it's way too big. So I don't know what I'm going to do. I think I'm going to change. I'm on a, on a 12 and it's all banged up. I may change to a 14, um, but I don't know what I'm going to do. Maybe I just yeah. like, I'll just go for the X Pro Max double X triple. <laughs> L. So it's on that L. note, it, it seems like there is not going to be a max anymore either. It's going to be a plus. Or I think that's what the rumor said. Does, did either of you follow it? No. So Wait, what's the yeah. difference between a max and a plus? Wait, what did you see? <laughs> yeah, plus. I don't think there's much difference at all. <laughs> it's just what they decide to call Weird. the thing. But yeah, I, but I, like, think, I think that's what I heard they, as far as rumors go. Hmm. That's interesting. I mean, now they have like AirPods Max, so they've expanded that moniker to other things. It'd be weird to just like throw it out for the phone. I'm waiting now. for the AirPods Max XL Plus Ultra. Like they're just going to be like a room. <laughs> you go a into room. the room and it's filled with like the best speakers you've ever seen uh -huh. and heard. Yeah. Yep. I think that's definitely on the docket for this week. Yeah, so on that topic, HomePods, AirPods, SpacePods, <laughs> are we getting that I something? Would, I'd love new HomePod. I would love it. I just got um, a HomePod mini, I don't know, a month or two ago. It's pretty great. And I, I already had a, a normal HomePod. But uh, I missed the, you know, the tap to resume playing thing uh, that the mini has, but that normal HomePod doesn't. So it'd be cool to see the, an update. The normal HomePod has that. No, it doesn't. No, I mean, like, sorry, tap your, like, if you're playing something on your phone, you, like, tap it on the top of the HomePod, and it, like, swaps over to I the I can't HomePod. hear you over me being right. <laughs> 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 no, sorry, what were you saying? Like, I mean, like, if you're playing something on your phone, you, like, put your phone next to the HomePod mini, it, like, swaps over to the, the It uses the, the U1 chip. Mini. So yeah. the 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 oh, big HomePod. Oh, so the new one. That. So the old one doesn't have like the uh, yeah like the no. HomePod solo. Okay. Yeah. My uh, we we use a pair of of large HomePods as our like TV stereo, uh, via like yeah. eARC and all that. Um, and that has overall just been like a super flaky experience in the past few months, where yeah. like every time we turn on the TV, we also need to press volume up for the the volume to come out at all like it's not a big deal but it's like death by a thousand cuts kind of thing um yep. and lately uh it's been coming out of one speaker but not the other like it's loud enough to not care uh but again death by a thousand cuts uh so uh i hope that the new the new os whatever they call it for home pods audio os uh i hope that like is better with uh the new like release cycle that's coming out in like two weeks um but yeah if it isn't then if it just makes things worse i'm just gonna be more sad because i really like the setup in general uh but in practice it yeah it's it's a little a little uh handholdy uh mm -hmm. for my here's feelings. my crazy prediction they know about this and they've developed a new protocol that supplants bluetooth for their Airplane? own devices I mean, this is not Bluetooth. Bluetooth. This is all. Sucks. This is all over Wi-Fi. Is it Wi-Fi? Yeah. yeah. Then they come up with a new protocol that supplants Wi-Fi for their own devices. No, Wi-Fi is great. <laughs> well, if it's for, great, then what's like the issue you don't need to, you don't need six hundred megabits for audio. Like uh, Wi-Fi is not the issue. 
Uh, it's like making sure that the devices are awake and don't like spaz out midway. That's that's yeah, the that's issue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there mm. is something wrong with like wireless speakers. I've had those same issues that you've mentioned and I've had all other issues. Like they just, they don't just work. I want a HomePod that just works. Yeah. It, it unfortunately did, right? The first iteration on the first version, like that always just works and then it suddenly gets yeah. worse over time. I guess Apple engineers are not writing documentation up with their PRs to like keep things in line. Um, <laughs> uh, in terms of other things that are supposedly maybe coming out, the iPhone 14 is maybe going to get a pill-shaped like camera cutout. Oh, so mm-hmm. all those times where we made fun of Android phones for having a, yeah. a keyhole uh, for a key ring, like that's going to now be reality for iPhones. Um, and I saw some pretty cool mock-ups where people like extended the pill. Uh, so you have one pill in the middle for the cameras and then you have another pill for battery, another pill for uh, this. And it kind of looks Ooh. okay-ish. Uh, so of, of course, we'll, we'll have to see how uh, Apple puts it together. Um, but yeah, that's probably going to be a thing on the pro models and not on the non-pro models. Or so I've heard. I don't mind it. No, I, yeah. I, I saw a mock-up and it's okay. Like yeah, the um, there are a couple like Android phones that have the um, I don't know what you really call it, but like a um, there there's a pixel layer over the camera and it somehow turns off and you know it's like oh so it turns off while the camera's on yeah and so basically you can't see it or it's pretty hard to see as the screen is on normally but then it shuts off but I mean there's still there are you know still pixel elements in front of the camera and so i don't know if the technology is quite there i think that's where it'll eventually get to Mm -hmm. but on one hand it doesn't quite look like the rest of the pixels when it's on and i would assume that the the image quality is slightly degraded because there's literally some elements there's a screen in front of it the camera yeah so sometime i don't know somehow get the pixel elements to literally move That'd be cool. I don't know how you do it. No, I, I think it's just going to get smaller and smaller, like light emitting diodes. Perhaps. Like if you have a micro, micro LEDs, those are really, really tiny. So most of the space around them is empty and therefore the camera is just going to be oblivious to their existence, right? It's like having a little smudge That's on the lens. The camera doesn't really see that. Um, so as long as it's regular and not like a big blotch, then that should be fine. But yeah, as you said, I don't think we're we're there yet i think we're definitely getting a pill this year (laughs) yeah which is fine i mean honestly it's it's so funny how much of a you know of like pitchforks torches and pitchforks that there were when the notch came out and i don't even notice the notch so shrinking it down will be like cool but not necessarily like something that i would need or be like super stoked about you know Mm mm-hmm be a good in- incremental upgrade though yeah and then the final thing that people have rumored for the iphone 14 is satellite connectivity um and this is spawned on further by uh spacex and uh, oh. t-mobile saying that they're going to have satellite connectivity uh as well uh like i think this was a month ago uh so oh. Like, yeah, I guess that would be cool to be able to send texts no matter where we are on the planet. Um, and I, yeah, I thought they were saying that you didn't even need like a like a normal current phone would be able to do that. Like you didn't need any sort of an upgrade. I mean, maybe by the time that comes out, then all the phones would have it. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. They're banking on newer phones in the future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we're making an announcement for five years from now by then all the yeah, phones maybe. out will will support it yep i mean I, think... I can see that being really cool for like emergency situations like you're you're out camping and you're in the middle of nowhere and somehow you can still you apple know. save me hey siri and that's it. <laughs> I... call yeah yeah I mean, the watch can do that for you, right? When it detects that you fall uh, off a cliff, yeah. it can be like, well, "Hey, not come if you rescue don't me." Have any connection. The, the nearest helicopter is two thousand hours away. Please wait. Yeah. <laughs> Please hold on. 
um, I think the difficulty in a lot of these like um, predictions is that is this a thing where it's like why would we ever want 64 bit phones and then you're like oh wow like we did want those or is this like I don't think that ever came to pa- I don't think anyone cared about 64 bit phones or not no 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 but but <laughs> I remember like other chip makers especially like uh, Qualcomm being like who the heck needs 64 bits? And then in the end, it was like, okay, we, like, it was a decent <laughs> upgrade. And I think the same way about satellites. It's like, who the heck would want satellite? And then until we have it, right? Hiking, and then I break a bone. And then I'm like, oh, dang. Yeah. Apple would have saved me. I mean, even for the more mundane cases, like you go camping and someone's like going to follow you up a day later, it's like, oh, hey, watch out. There's a rock on the road. Or, oh, yeah. shoot, we forgot right. to bring ice. Bring more ice. Um, like, I think that's going to be much more useful than the, the emergency cases, uh, for the most part, because that's like emergencies are thankfully rare. They're not an everyday occurrence. Um, and I've gone camping plenty of times where we're just in a cell dead zone for five days and people Mm -hmm. are like, we don't go as like a group, but people come like every few days and get added to our group. Um, so it'd be sometimes like we forget something and we have to drive two hours to the nearest uh, gas station town. Uh, and I say that because it's literally just like a gas station and one other restaurant. And that's it. That's the town. Uh, but they have cell service. So uh, that's like or they didn't have cell service very until very recently, but they did have a payphone, um, And that was like how you would uh, get to the outside world to to mention that you needed something. So. Uh, I can see just that aspect as being way more useful. Like, I think SpaceX uh, did, like, open up their uh, Starlink. Like, you can you can bring a portable dish with you. Um, and I have absolutely considered the next time I go camping to maybe just get one and bring one with me, right? Yeah. You just connect it to a power bank, and then you have you have easy internet uh, anywhere in the in the world, or at least in the U.S. I don't know. Like, they say you can't use it on, like, shorelines. I guess they turn the satellites off when they're over, like, big swaths of ocean just so that way they save power. Um, I'm not too sure well, what's going on there. Didn't Did you hear about that thing where they're going to offer it to, like, people on yachts? And I think it's going to be, like, stupid expensive. So, like... Yeah, it's like $5,000. Yeah. I don't know. So, yeah, I'm assuming they turn off the satellites when they're just in the middle of the ocean because... Like, why waste the power? Um, so if you're going to need the power, then you're going to pay for the power. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, other than iPhones, uh, the other thing that tends to get announced are Apple Watches. Um, any of you looking forward to new Apple Watches? I might. I don't know. I have a Series 4, and it works fine for everything I use. So, I've lost my it, faith on the Apple Watch, but I would like I I bought a regular watch, which is pretty nice, uh, mm. because notifications suck. And yeah, you can turn them off, but then it just becomes mostly a watch. Um, the big big thing that I really like, and I would, I would like them if they just went like crazy and split up the watch into like the regular watch and the health watch which goes goes along with uh uh what with the new rumors about like the glucose or there's been other other crazy rumors right about like measuring like um, sensors yeah different health sensors like that i would love that i that would be great because then i can just wear that at night and not worry if I, I'm about to die. It'll wake me up. Just like look with a fall. You're about so, to die. <laughs> Panic. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> Panic. At least I know. The nearest yeah. helicopter is 2,000 hours. I, I uh, do know one person that admitted themselves to the hospital because they panicked themselves watching their heart rate go up. Um, and they thought they were having a heart attack when they are just... Like making their heart rate go up by watching their heart rate go up. Yeah. So, yeah. like that is a thing that happens, unfortunately. Uh, but it's not, like never happened to me. Like I see my heart rate and it goes down, and I'm like, ah, I guess, I guess seeing something um, rhythmic is soothing me <laughs> more than panicking <laughs> me. 
<laughs> but yeah, going all in on health instead of like notifications and everything else that the watch offers, I would really dig that. Even if it's more expensive, like a, even if it's like borderline a medical device, I would really, really love that. I would love it too, because I would buy the opposite that only has notifications, because that's all I use my watch for. I, that's and it my would be point. cheaper. Right? Just bring You're like, it up darn you, rings, keeping reminding me. I don't want you. <laughs> stop telling. Yes. Stop telling me yes. to stand up. I know, and, and I still don't do it. To the extremes with the rings, like jump through the fire, run 15 kilometers. I don't know, without people feeling bad. There was a like a quick aside from anything important here. Uh, there is a weird show uh, movie on Netflix. I don't remember the name of it because I did not choose it. It was just on and I was working and then I stopped working because this was totally out of left field. Um, and it is a French movie of in the future where uh, like we are overly reliant on AIs and robots and all that. And then there's these uh, like robot overlords who have uh, a TV show of like, primitive humans uh and they basically nice. use humans in all situations that would have been like like animals like bullfighting it's just a human that's charging at these robot people uh yeah. he, these robots walking their human dogs and then the human dogs like frolicking like very very bizarre <laughs> um and as the movie progresses uh these robot overlords basically make the humans do illegal things so that way they can trap them into showing up on the show for their entertainment. Um, and I don't know where I'm going with this, but that just like reminded me of that old movie. And it was so wacky that it's just inescapable in my mind, taking up rent um, and it's not paying any rent. Uh, so needed to share that with someone else to get it out. So yeah. Uh, I guess <laughs> Final thoughts on rumors there, I think, are going to be always on display iPhones. Does anyone care about that? Nope. Hopefully not. I cool. have often thought I wouldn't want my watch to be always on because it, it wakes up when I want it to, and that works just fine for me. So. Oh, the always on on the watch is kind of nice. If you I don't have that, don't you don't have it on the Series 4, right? No. Oh, yeah, you might spoil yourself if you end up using a regular watch because that not working is like, it is A regular nice. watch? Like, yeah, that one's is, always on. It's always on. Yeah. Yeah, obviously. Well, it's, it's a little awkward to change on. the battery once every five years, but exactly. it's only once every five years. So, yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> we all seem super, super excited for I was going to say, do we even like Apple? Like, <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> it's look it's like the the upgrades are so incremental mm -hmm. that i it's cool that like the cameras were bigger last last year but like uh, we've kind of plateaued and that's okay with me i'll yeah. be honest i'm way more excited about the software we're at that point yeah. where spencer yeah. just said like it's boring They're like oh Ceramic is coming back. Oh, always on display. Oh, like, it's like I wish ceramic cool. was coming back. There hasn't been a ceramic, ceramic watch for so two bad. for two years, and that might push Spencer over. Um, I held off getting a new watch because I was like, eh, "There's no ceramic one. I'm gonna keep my Series Five. Um, and I can't justify yeah. it. It's like two thousand dollars, though, so right? Expensive, yeah. No, it's about a thousand something. Uh, okay. There might. I don't know. Mm, for a watch that I only use when I'm out, maybe not. I don't know. They look so cool, though. Guaranteed to chip cars, paint, walls. Yeah. Good quality material there. So, as always, I want to personally thank everyone for listening in this week. Please be sure to follow us on Twitter at Code Completion to know when new episodes get released, and feel free to tweet at us if there's ever a topic you'd like for us to dig into. Most importantly, as a small podcast, please be sure to share this with your friends and family who are also interested in any part of the in any part of the process of app development. It's your support that enables us to continue doing this, and we hope to grow a healthy community around everything we discuss. 
Once again, I want to give my thanks to Spencer, who is at Spencer C. Curtis. That's S-P-E-N-C-E-R-C-C-U-R-T-I-S on Twitter. And Fernando, who is at From Junior to Senior, that's F-R-O-M-J-R-T-O-S-R on Twitter, for joining me this week. My name, once again, is Dimitri, and you can find me at Dimitri Buñol. That's D-I-M-I-T-R-I-B-O-U-N-I-O-L. And we'll see you all next week. Bye. 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 So I have a short commented out uh, that I promised from a few weeks ago. And that is this very cool thing so i finally put together the the mario cube um and for those listening because it's a podcast uh this is the mario uh question block lego set um and it does it does some cool things so uh, if i press here this part does that uh and then these kind of do that uh and you have like four little levels that are just like all on, on rubber bands. Um, yeah. And you have Mario at the front here. Uh, all of these kind of open up, but I am holding this with one hand, and that's precarious, so I'm just going to pull Mario out, uh, and I guess I'll leave that. Uh, but if you open this up, you have Bowser, uh, and nice. if you clonk him on the head, it's very hard with one hand. If you, if you destroy the oh, Lego no. thing with one hand. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> There you go. Uh, there's a little door that opens, a secret compartment, if you will. Um, oh. And then you can go oh, ahead go-karts. and put... No, no go-karts. But if you played Super Mario, you'll probably recognize some of this. Oh, gosh, this is so hard to with one hand. Like okay, Opa. so at the end of, of Super Mario 64, Mario kind of spins Bowser like oh, that. Oh, that's So great. that's the whole thing. Um, <laughs> Love it. Yeah. Uh, I need to put pieces back because they got destroyed midway of me making this demonstration. Uh, But that's the fun of Lego, right? Um, It's all about these little whimsical uh, little put-togethers and secrets that you, like, learn about as you're putting it together. So if I can try holding this with one hand, uh, like, the front of the castle just comes off and you have all the portraits uh, in there that you can jump into for the little worlds uh, and stuff like that. Nice pretty cool highly recommend if you like going through lego and putting a lot of effort into putting something together that you'll never take apart again uh i think there's like an acronym for adults who love lego owl adults who love lego owls or something um i learned that one recently but yeah this is like my second lego set so i'm still in the honeymoon period before super cool bored uh, but yeah, I found that one cool, kind of cool. I'm just looking it up online. It's that's super it's really cool. cool. Yeah, yeah. I thought these would be hard to get, but like at every Lego store, they just have tons of them. So Nintendo basically forced Lego don't make too little of these, make a lot of them, uh, and therefore they are not useful as Lego collectors' items because everyone will have mm-hmm. been able to get them. Uh, so do not use this to invest in Lego. Um, <laughs> that that's something i read a I long love... time ago like lego is one of the soundest possible investments you can make like almost every box will go for at least two times more like over a, a period of time than when you bought it so you could definitely buy boxes never open them and then just sell them on ebay and make instant profit almost every time that's crazy um Dang. just because they make a limited amount and then that's it uh but yeah i've i've seen plenty of these so if you want one like Definitely go get one. They're available uh, online right now. Yeah. No shortage. I love these little figures, though. They're so adorable. Like, the penguins and stuff. They're, it's just, I mean, it's, like, almost abstract because they're not, like... Yeah, it's, like, four Legos. Anything, but yeah, it's so cool. <laughs> and, like, even this little Bowser that's, is, like... That's just so a bunch of cool. Pieces. Yeah, I've seen it. Fernando just wants the Bowser. I'll, I'll pay you $1 for the Bowser. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But no shipping. Uh, you can make your <laughs> own. <laughs> uh, sorry, guys. I got to run. But this was a good episode. It was good. Bye, All right. people. Bye. Bye.